up everyone? It's me again, your guy Ed. And I hope you're all staying well and healthy despite this pandemic. It's been a while since we caught up and for today's episode, we're giving you not one, but two great minds who believe in the future of accounting. Today, we celebrate a partnership that only redefined the new accounting age, but also provided many opportunities to many Filipino talents all around the country. Let's hear their stories and be inspired as to why the Philippines is the next accounting resource for the BPO industry. Cheers. So, welcome to Marvin. So, we've got Marvin here, and I love your t-shirt, Marvin. The old backroom t-shirt. You must have a different version to me. I don't think I got, I'll fit I just, in <laughs> it's, it's fresh out of the printing press. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is my second podcast with the backroom, and today I've got Marvin Galang here um, from Double Rule and now with the backroom. So um, I thought it'd be a good idea to start off and, and let's hear a bit, bit more about Marvin and not so much about me, but Marvin, can you tell us a bit about Double Rule, about its journey, uh, and tell us a bit more about US Tax and your journey with Zero? Thanks, Wayne. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, you know wherever our listeners are, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, first, I'm well. Uh, I'm excited to be part of the back room now, and uh, looking forward to the next uh, you know five or eight years again, as uh, as Double Rule celebrated its uh, eighth year anniversary before joining the back room. We started in 2013. Uh, I was coming off a Another CPA firm. It's it's a failed. Uh, we had a failed startup, and uh, at that time, you know, I was I didn't know what to do. Myself and Jenny uh, had a few clients, uh, you know, in, in that that we were servicing at that time at the, out of our garage uh, in our home in Marikina, and you know, we we the zero accounting software was introduced to us. Uh, we we love we love zero we love the functionalities and we really saw an opportunity to do something uh, with, with Z- using zero as our core accounting app so we talked to our accounting manager at that time uh, her name is Dorothy she's no longer with zero but uh, Dorothy said you know I can help you in terms of growing your client base in the US by giving you a business plan, right? So, okay, so uh, we waited for the business plan and here she comes, she, she brings us a business plan of a hundred of a hundred uh, organizations or hundred uh, subscriptions with zero. And I was joking with Dorothy, Dorothy, this is not a business plan. This is a bankruptcy plan, knowing we had 10 clients uh, generating a few thousand dollars and now I'm gonna be you know, paying for a few thousand again with the zero subscription. But, you know, we had a different mindset at that time. We know in order to grow. What year was that? Was that back in? That that, that was 2013. Jeez. So how long had zero been in the U.S.? It wouldn't have been long at all. It wouldn't have been long. Actually, I think it was their third year. Uh, They came in the U.S. about the same time they did in Australia. Uh, from what I from what I recall, that time. So you, you would have been yeah. one of the early adopters of zero in the US. That's exactly what we saw as well, because we looked at the advisory directory of zero advisors directory, and we saw hey, there's so there's a few hundreds of them in there, and there's only a few where we're at. You know, we were in California, and so we saw that as a as a big opportunity. So. You know, and we know we're going to have to spend money on marketing anyway. So instead of looking at it as a, as a cost, we saw it as an opportunity to use that money in terms of marketing. And that was also presented to us. You know, Zero had the budget on helping CPA firms. We took that budget, created our website for the first time. I have a website uh, for, for an accounting firm, right? And, uh, and, and yeah, and then now we, had, we just had to start start marketing yeah well that's similar to our journey marvin with finley and co in new zealand we were 
early adopters of zero in it, it helped their growth uh, phenomenally, you know, with, with what went on. But the US, you've got 51 states, 52. And so you can, each state is like a country in New Zealand. So, so there's, um, there's still lots of potential with zero in the US and, and getting on that bandwagon to, to grow your CPA firm. Right, right. But you know, Wayne, what's interesting is because when we set up the double rule, uh, we were 100% uh, offshore. Right. So we were 100% in the Philippines and we had no employees in the U.S. Uh, I already moved back here from my stint in the U.S. Um, and, uh, you know, we couldn't find our way back. And this is, and, you know, Zero said, hey, you don't have to be in the U.S., if you if you if you have an office and if you want to run your firm and that was a very interesting argument uh, your discussion with zero but you know it eventually worked I created an LLC uh, you know took zero but my first instinct was hey look I have I have a hundred licenses or at that time 90 licenses that I need uh, you know I just don't I want to recover the cost or I need to recover the cost right so the first thing I did was, you know, I spoke to CPA firms and people that I know, practitioners that I know in the Philippines, because I'm here and, and I was born, raised here, educated here. So I thought, look, uh, my colleagues at that time, my peers were already at the level where they could make decisions, uh, mid-management, higher management level. So you know, why not introduce them to the cloud, to the technology, to what's new, greatest and latest in accounting. And I did that for, for a, a couple months, right? And, you know, everyone was excited. Wow, this looks good. Uh, we love it. But nobody was willing to open their wallets. <laughs> so, so the reality kicked in. And, you know, I told Jenny, look, um, this is not going to work. You know, um, I found myself uh, back in the U.S., but at, the, at that time, I had the same strategy. You know, um, it, I need to find a multiplier uh, because I cannot go business to business to consider B2C, right? So I went to B2B or business to partnerships or CPA firms. And, and I spoke to uh, all the firms that I know, friends that I know in the U.S. that have, uh, that have run their practices and, and it worked out. Yeah, it does. You know, the fir- <laughs> so you grew the, your the firm. Fir- mm-hmm. I grew the firm, but you know what's interesting is it started as a CPA practice, where in the first six months it became an outsourcing practice. Yeah. The, the reason is, you know, I talked to the firm, they loved it, they liked it. Okay, Marvin, count me in. I want to sign up, I want to use zero, I want to migrate some of my orgs from another software to zero. Here's the problem. I don't know how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> neither, neither does uh, my staff because they're, they're, you know, it's, it's new, right? So, you don't. That's not a problem. Uh, I can do that, but you know, our firm can do that, but it's going to be out of the, out in the Philippines. Uh, but we can do it. Uh, you know, we can do the conversion. We can provide this, the, the, the support. And eventually, they said yes, right? So from an accounting practice to traditional accounting practice to now supporting cloud solutions via offshore, you know, offshore resources. Mm-hmm. So that, you know, that, that grew, that uh, continued for the next year and a half until we were, you know, we finished the 100 licenses. I bought another 150 and sold another 150 in the next uh, six months. And, you know, I, I got a phone call from zero. Well, yeah. at that time, the, the president of Zero in the U.S., uh, which is Russ Fujioka, and Russ uh, wanted to find out what's going on. <laughs> so I can still remember that conversation because Russ was kind of amazed, like, "How do you guys do it?" And the first question he asked was, "Marvin, before you start, how many employees do you have in the U.S.?" And I told them, "No pun intended, but we have zero employees so in the U.S." So you were one hundred percent cloud. In the Philippines, effectively. Effectively, yes, and he—that's where he was. He was kind of—he was very surprised, very amazed. 
and uh, you know, one meeting led to another. He offered me, he offered me a um, an option where a possibility. You know, we just discussed some possibilities as they were trying to grow their presence in the U.S. And he said, "Look, you know, we were thinking of doing this initiative. Maybe we can do, we can provide sales. You know, um, frontline pre-sales chat, you know, web in if for the U.S. market." And see and see how that goes. We know there's traffic coming in. Uh, we don't have a, a channel that captures that that mar that uh, traffic, you know, in the U.S. side. And 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 you know, we'd we'd love we'd love to see if that works from resources that you have in the Philippines. And so we tried it in 2015 in June yeah. of 2015 uh, with with you know six employees running um, U.S. Chat sales uh, for zero, right? Uh, in in so the directly US. involved with zero, <clears throat> right? And that led to another uh, challenge that they have in terms of helping CPA firms do conversion or convert from their existing yeah. application. It would be easy if there's only you know a few of them, you know, primarily the the not the top competitor there, because there were already solutions that automatically converts them, but U.S. is very fragmented in terms of you know number of apps that they're using. So you know there there's really quite a handful of uh, different software. So Zero needed the solution for that. Um, again, he said, "Hey, can you try this? Are you doing conversions?" Well, with that, that's the primary service we're offering to CPA firms uh, when when we were selling them the licenses, right? And um, we tried, you know, a handful of conversions led to a hundreds, and now, you know, we've done probably over ten thousand conversions Jeez, uh, for the lot. for U U.S. and uh, yeah, U.S. and Canada. That will mean you have quite a lot of staff, pretty pretty experienced in zero now. They they would have come a lot across a lot of different situations. Yes, yes, and it, 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 there was a point where we had probably a hundred zero certified. Uh, uh, people yeah. in the zero in the zero uh, advisor directory. So, Jeez. right. So back then, that was probably when we first met. Was it around San Diego? When was that? That was coming through 2018. Yeah, 2019 uh, through our mutual friend, Mr. Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> through Bruce, yeah. So we, we yeah. you know, the the outsourcing. Uh, again, focus on CPA practices, helping them with zero. Eventually, led to the CPA firms asking if we're doing, if we're offering other services, which is primarily bookkeeping yep. and and you know and other uh, processes in accounting and finance. And that's where I met Bruce. I met Bruce in well, I met him way way back, uh, two thousand actually 2013 i met bruce in 2013 in the yeah. first zero road show that i attended yeah but we, we never got acquainted i, I uh, uh we really you know had our first uh, meeting in 2016 talking yeah. about outsourcing uh, offshore primarily in the philippines and how how we've done it and uh, and I, in 2017 uh, Bruce and I met again in Melbourne, if I'm not mistaken. The zero there, we conference, just, yeah. The zero, yeah, zero con so in Bruce, Melbourne. So Bruce, just for listeners, he is HPCA, wasn't it, his firm? And then he then merged in with Aprio and started Aprio Cloud. So just did right. really well. Um, quite, a, quite a big firm in the US based out of Atlanta. Um, just... Uh, while I've got you here, I need to ask some questions because uh, one of the what what we need to talk about here is is why we chose the Philippines. Obviously, you're from the Philippines, and 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 I chose the Philippines. You you, you didn't have much say in, in why you chose the Philippines, but you can give us some good insights into why the Philippines work so well from a accounting and offshoring. Why why is it so special? To me, in a nutshell. Yes. So, um, my uh, after college, I actually worked for a multinational company that started their offshore 
uh, shared service in the Philippines. And that's, that's actually my, my second job. I got involved with offshore uh, accounting services, shared services, you know, with this multinational. And the reason I'm sharing this is because I can still remember when they were, I believe I was employee number 18, if I'm not uh-huh. mistaken, <laughs> of, that, of that multinational shared services company. And I can still remember when they were sharing their reasons, you know, they were giving us this whole big picture, grand vision, and sharing with us why the Philippines, um, because there were a couple of other competitors as far as countries in in Asia, in the region. Um, In North America, I believe they chose Costa Rica. And then in Europe, they were in Newcastle in, in, in England. So why the Philippines and our number one competitor at that time was, was, was India. And again, yeah. this is accounting and finance. So they mentioned overall in terms of supply of people, the level of education, primarily in accounting and finance. Um, well, government, they also, they also looked into yeah. you know, the stability, the political and economic stability and overall, the vision of the country where, you know, services or outsourced services will be headed. And but to me, what struck is the number one thing that struck me most is uh, probably our, uh, you know, command of the English language. What did you say? <laughs> Which the other I was. Way? Uh, someone was surprised that you'd learnt English as your first language, effectively. That became, you know, it became a, a, a lot. There's a lot of stories behind that. And, and even to my, myself, when I moved back in the U.S. or I moved to the U.S. in 2000, in the in year 2000, so I was looking for a job and I was interviewed uh, by KPMG. Uh, so this guy from Utah, he was in the room and, and, you know, two questions. Number one, of course, the traditional one, Marvin, uh, tell me something about yourself. So I started talking to him about my background, education, how I came to the U.S., blah, blah, blah. And then he was looking at me, you know, seems to have so many questions in mind. The second question that came out of his mouth was like, Marvin, where did you learn how to speak English? (laughs) And so he did not have an idea that English was kind of our first language. It's, It's our second language. Yeah. But it is, uh, it becomes our first language because, you know, from elementary, preschool, uh, all the way to college, uh, I mean, uh, 80%, maybe even 90% of our, uh, of, of our classes, of our curriculum is built around the English language. And that's how they deliver, they yeah. deliver the, um, yeah, the teachings. And, and the Philippines, from an educational standpoint, is you have to go to university or to to get ahead in life in the Philippines. There's a lot of, per head, I imagine the, the amount of people that go to university is a lot higher than anywhere else in the world. That's true. It is true. It's, it's part of the culture. It's embedded in the culture where parents would, you know, that's their belief. Yeah. I mean, we may not have a lot in life, and and uh, you know eventually we're gonna we're gonna move on. But uh, what I will leave you is good education, so you can stand on your own and uh, and really make a life out of yourself. So that's really part of our culture. It's unlike the Western culture, or at least before yeah. in the U.S., where you know um, they started working. They start working, and maybe you know the value of that of the education um, may not be as um, as significant as it is in the Philippines, the way we see it. Yeah, like even, you know, to work in a, uh, to be a waitress in a bar or a cleaner, yeah. you sort of have to have some higher education to to, to work in those roles. Uh, whereas I know in New Zealand or the US, you, you just do it. Uh, the Philippines is right. different, isn't it? In, in that perspective. Um. One thing is, you mentioned India before, and it's interesting comparing India to the Philippines, and and that's one thing we did when we, with our accounting firm, was to uh, to compare 
the two countries and the the cultures and and you know obviously we we found in favor of the philippines but i think a lot too has to do with the different models in the philippines and india where india is more of a what would you call it a job by job or the the, the pure outsourcing where in the Philippines we've found we can do more of the offshoring, what we call where you have your full-time person working specifically for you. Do, do you want to comment on that, Marvin? Because it's quite interesting as to how that's developed. Uh, yeah, actually, I... I... I eventually noticed that because you know, part when we initially offered our outsourcing solutions, they were really in the same model as the ones in India. It's 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 um it's really built on service level agreements, mm. and what they're paying for is the output, not necessarily just just the people. But then eventually, you know, companies, firms, uh, you know, there's they they want a certain level of control certain level of um, uh, you know process that they have in mind yeah and and um, and it's something that we have to we have to address um, I think that's uh, that's primarily what we've noticed yeah like a lot of the accounting firms especially the the, the mid to large have a lot of IP training already built on to their firm and they want to get that, I suppose, the quality assurance or make sure that they're getting that output. And sometimes by having the control of the employee, being able to help with the training, the onboarding, um, obviously security as well is a big thing. Is a big thing. And by using offshoring as a model means that, that they can do that. Um, right. And the other thing that's good too with Philippines is, is the time zones. Uh, um, you know, in, in the culture in the Philippines too, I think, is, is a more caring, uh, nurturing type culture to they really want to be involved um, with your firm. So they want to be a part of a team. And I think that works quite well with the, with the, the offshoring model. It's 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 a uh, something that's known about Filipinos and not you know it's it's the level of hospi uh, hospitality or hosp they're very hospitable and accommodating um, you know very friendly and then I think that is also built in the cost the level of customer service that uh, that you know that companies experience at least even in our firm when we started. You know, we have to differentiate ourselves with a lot of competitors because we're, you know, we're not, we're not the first one. Yeah. You know, we're coming in, a, we're coming in a situation where there's already hundreds of them. In fact, even in the offshoring standpoint, back in 2013, we couldn't say we're the pioneers. Uh, we've tried it with the first, uh, with, with the failed startup that I that I came from in 2007 and then even at that time that multinational that i was referring to that was already 1999 you know so it's it's been going uh maybe at that not at the scale where it is now but it was there so how do you differentiate yourself uh, from the others and and you know we saw that that's uh, that's a big thing it's it's the level of customer service the level of experience that we are known for uh, and and it has just it has to translate in the way we provide our service, particularly in accounting. Yeah. And I think Filipinos, it's their second nature, you know, to 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 care, to accommodate, uh, and be hospitable. Yeah, and, and it's our role too, is is being um, employing these people to make sure that they get the balance right, because that's important too in the Philippines is the work life balance. Family is big. So making sure that they get some time to spend with family, um, you know, and, you know, spiritual as well, have some time with church and with other things. So it's, um, it's getting the balance right is important in the Philippines as well, isn't it? Not working huge hours. 
it's it that is very important and i'm glad you mentioned that because you know in my first weeks here i, I it, with the with the back room i talked to a couple of people uh, especially in the leadership and uh, and really looking at how uh you know trying to understand the culture and all that and and i'd love to say this is what uh, they like about the back room uh which is which is again it kind of reinforces the reason also we 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 merged into this yeah. uh into this partnership is this because we're it's the shared uh, value shared culture of uh of looking after people first uh eventually it's not always going to be about money it's it's a balance of uh, nice. profit and purpose so and and that's what we found here um, and I, i think you hit the right spot where uh you know as the filipinos uh love that you know they 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 look at that with their employers with the companies that they work for and even to the point that hey i'm with i'm willing to work for you for free uh just because i know you care for me right so yeah. i mean of course that's <laughs> not near at that right really free but <laughs> yeah Yeah, well, it, you know, that's what right now we're looking at some OJTs or interns and, and um, there's a, you know, we've been inundated with people wanting to work for us um, as interns. Um, just just because one, we're, we're online, cloud-based, and two, the, the reputation. So it, it's, it's spreading. So it's interesting the way things are, are panning out. Um, but it's also like uh, staff welfare is right now with COVID too, it's quite important and that work-life balance with a lot of staff working from home is getting that right. Um, and, and also it's really competitive over here as well with, with salaries. Um, there's different players in the market. So um, I, I've, I've only seen good things as far as, you know, the, the economy of the Philippines and the, what would you call it, the, a uh, disposable dollar for the for the Filipino the average Philippine CPA accountant is they're doing okay at the moment um compared to what it was probably 10 15 years ago yeah um it has doubled it tripled if i'm not you know if i'm doing the right, the math right because i i remember when i started my career with a local company, even with a shared service, uh, compared to what our our current going uh, going rate is at, at this point, and you know it it's also interesting how our you know the clients, the offshore clients, are also accommodating that. You know, obviously they're already saving money, uh, but uh, they're also providing that those opportunities to our staff here. Yeah. No, it, the, the quality of life and um, it just where we are in Pampanga and Clark, it's, a, it's really, you know, before COVID, it was growing. Um, it's stalled a wee bit now, but I, I can see post-COVID, it, it's going to be um, a, a growing area. You know, modern buildings, connections through to Manila with, you know, the train, then the airport, and also Subic close by it's uh yeah it's certainly a, a growing area uh, yes good to mention that we're very excited about that because we've seen the development going up north and uh you know mm. the back room is 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 one of the first movers there in fact uh yeah i've already made the announcement we're going to be up north next year or at least uh we're already planning for that right. so we're joining the bandwagon For sure. <laughs> yeah, that's the way to do it. Um, yeah, what was I going to ask you too, Marvin? Just uh, it, it was topical, actually. I just got an email through today from Spotlight, and it was uh, a trends, a global trends report had come through. And, it, and I was going to mention some of the, you know, where the future of accounting is going or where you see it. Um, and I think I shared that with you, but it's, it's only like, half an hour old so but some of the things in there is quite interesting and, and maybe to give us a bit of an insight to the listeners as to where we see accounting firms going in the future um would be quite interesting because we we see it from the inside out don't we we can see 
how other accounting firms are doing it. And there are some firms that are doing really well um, in using you know, our model, like the offshoring model, to grow their business advisory or add new services. So where do you see, see the accounting industry going in the, the next five to 10 years, like on a global scale, yeah. maybe? Yeah, you know that's a very good that's a very good topic to, to go into. Um, in 2013, when we started looking for resource, uh, you know the talent is there, but I'd like I'd like to, you know, I'd like to say it 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 takes a lot of mm. training development um, in order to get it to the level that you that you want it. Just a side story, I was. Uh, uh, I was given an opportunity to join another big four in 2011 that is primarily focused on tax, right? And so this firm came, uh, you know, from New York. I did the interview. I thought it was just a, I didn't know it was a job interview because eventually mm -hmm. I got offered the job. And, uh, you know, they, they want to move their, uh, or at least part of their resource and, and come up with a contingency from, you know, from India to the Philippines. Yeah. Uh, and, and I asked them, so how many so this people is a big do we need? Four, top four firm. Yeah. This is a top four firm that has operations in India. Um, and, you know, and I asked them, how many people are we looking at in terms of, in terms of, uh, in terms of manpower? And that was November of 2011 and they told me, can you build, uh, can you get 50 people up and running uh, in May <laughs> the following year, right? right? So I, I told them, look, um, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to take the job because I, I don't wanna over promise something because I know I, I won't be able to deliver it. And the reason I know I'm not gonna be able to deliver it is because it would it takes time. The talent's there, as I've said, but it's gonna take time to develop, to train them. You have to because invest, in, don't you? You have to invest yeah. in your people, just like you would we with have, your own firm. Yeah. Yes, we have to invest, we have to train, we have to transfer the technology because it was very it was young at that time. You know, the infrastructure from the education system, you know, the, the, the overall, it wasn't there. And it, we proved that in 2013 when we said, hey, we're going to do this. We hired an employee. We had to transfer the technology. They are not familiar with QuickBooks uh, online or Zero, especially with Zero being a new player in the country. Uh, not familiar with a lot of tools that we're using. So we had to invest heavily in training and it cost a lot of money in terms of transferring that technology. Now it's not, it's a different story. You know, where, where, where the Philippines is at today probably is where New Zealand, Australia, or even the, in the U S is at back in 2000 or early 2000 in terms of education, where we're seeing, we're seeing these tools being taught in schools. Yeah, you know, probably just in the last year or two years, uh, we're seeing the growth of, you know, offshore uh, service providers, more specific to finance and accounting, also helping drive, you know, the need and the push to the universities to transform in terms of education. Uh, the pandemic has provided, you know, not well. I mean, you know, we cannot talk all about the negative stuff that it brought, but I think yeah. on the positive side, it has pushed uh, accounting associations to transform, yeah. providing more training, education, partnerships, relationships with with companies that can help them. Uh, I'm part of the Philippine Institute of CPAs, um, you know, SME and SMP committee. So this is a committee on on enterprise and pra practices. Uh, that is focused this year primarily on digital. Right. It's the first time. It's the first time. I mean, they've talked about digital for quite some time, but really now the current uh, administration has said, "Look, it's time to, you know, to adapt." So let's not uh, let's not just, let's not just push about awareness. How do we now push for adoption? Yeah. And so he, you know, they, we started championing application software companies. You know, Zero is going to be involved there. 
So we have an event on October 21 to 23. This is the first technology fair that this association has conducted ever, ever, which I mean, you know, you from New Zealand and people from Australia, you've had that for quite some time for accountants, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's it's very exciting. It's very exciting uh, what we're seeing here. So it provides more uh, opportunities for for accountants, uh, for young professionals who really want to learn and and thrive. Also for for outsourcing companies and and, and even for for our client base. Uh, all over the world. I mean, it's it's a lot of resource available. Uh, the talent is ubiquitous. Oh, the the talent is, is there, Marvin. And we're seeing it too now with, with some of the firms that, that are looking for people or staff in the roles they're asking for. Before it was more, you know, we would call it the compliance basic bottom of the pyramid. But now some of the roles we're looking for are quite detailed and experienced roles, aren't they? They're more top of the pyramid type roles, you know, analytical, you know, finance people, valuation type people, uh, senior tax type people doing, you know, quite complicated type um, diversified work. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, so, so um, yeah. Just, just to cap that off, it it kind of pushes the service levels, not 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 necessarily on the, not focusing on the transaction side or the lower level of you know outsourced operations, but because of these availability of talents, the technology, you know, uh, awareness and adoption, it's going to eventually drive um, you know the the services to go into the advisory space. You know, and yes. then, yeah, um, I can US see that. City. It's a natural progression, isn't it? That that advisory is going to come from from you know offshoring, um, right? Right. Now, just if you look at the spotlight report, the big one of the biggest issues is just getting staff, a talented staff, and and right now I know in Australia, New Zealand, because no one can come into the country. You you, you can't get in. So there's a silo at the moment of talent. There's only so much in the country. And so how do you grow your accounting firm? You know, if you need more people, you're just heat recruiting off someone else. Uh, it's, right. it's really hard to grow at scale. Um, so really offshoring is, is a way to do that. Um, what do you see like, uh, I was going to talk about silos. Um, one of the things I'm seeing with accounting firms and are offering new services and different, we call them the, the trendy word now is verticals. We're seeing that happening with a lot of accounting firms where they find a niche and then building teams around that niche. Um, and, and that's got a lot of growth. I can see that happening um, more and more what are you seeing from your side on that i think it's a you know eventually when everyone is is in the same playing you know it's, it's in this they're they're playing in the same field yeah and you know the the resources are equal um where unlike before uh, you know technology is some may find it expensive because they're early, but now the more you know, the more technology has become available to everyone, it levels the playing field for CPA practices, right? And yeah. and I think if you're if you're running a firm, you really have to find a niche, in in a way. Um, I, I, I mean, you know, it, yeah. it might be controversial, but I've known I've known a CPA firm in the U.S. that you know that has done this successfully. One of them uh, has focused their practice on cannabis industry. Yeah, right? it's, it's a big and thing in the U.S. It's it's it, yeah. it's huge. It's huge, and it's so and and they've they've really they've really done very well. There's another one that I know that has focused on primarily on e-commerce, mm. you know? So, I mean, they can provide services to anybody, but, but, but really uh, finding that, that niche 
in yeah. terms of uh, where we can find, where we can focus our resources on uh, training, education, and then client servicing. So this company just did e-commerce because he knows it's going to grow. So, um, you know, I've and and I think for a CPA firm, for CPA practices, that's really especially at this at, at this time of the pandemic. Uh, there has to be an exercise of, you know, we don't have a lot of answers to whatever hap- whatever is happening. I think the best exercise they can do now is really asking questions, asking the right yeah. questions where Just the value of that is wants, more. Isn't it? And, and, and if you've got the other uh, services you can offer, then you don't need more clients. You've got enough clients probably. It's just offering more services to those clients. You know what we call True. a trusted advisor, isn't it? So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of clients uh, in in insurance, looking at banking, um, valuation services. You know, uh, quite a lot really. App advisory. That's another thing that is just getting your app suite that you deal with, and knowing that well, so you can then offer those uh, to clients. Uh, there's there's a lot of room to move in that space um, with new apps coming in all the time. Right. Yeah. Um, what do you think about AI? Where do you see that happening, especially with Zero and um, with you know some of the things that Zero are doing around their coding? There could be some changes there in the future. It's it, it's again it's it's a um... It's an exciting space. Uh, to me, I think it, it's 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 still it's still early. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we'd love that Zero is investing there uh, and other similar apps. Um, but in terms of adoption, really, as far as other you know the practices, I think it's still in the early stage. Um, uh, it's it's the, a lot of the unknowns that they're that they are uh, that they're looking into. But I think again, as more and more technologies come out. And becomes more affordable, uh, then you know we'd see a lot of uh, movement in terms of in terms of AI. But with zero, I mean they've always they've always been in the forefront of these things. We're yeah. really focusing on how they can help practices, uh, you know, lighten up their load, uh, make transaction processing faster, more efficient, uh, and and you know, and I think that's that's a value you're getting from uh, partnering with them. Yeah, I think efficiency is is you know, one of our things that we've always focused on is trying to continually improve your systems and 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 zero has become more efficient. It, there's no doubt about it that you can get things done a lot lot better and a lot smarter. Um, and that's one of the reasons you know we you'll see our prepping system that we introduced. You know, we've now got. Um, offering that out to clients and that's working well for New Zealand and Australia it's something that we're looking at offering out to the US um, you know probably in a month or two once we get get the grad scheme going there so um, that's something that we're excited about Um, but yeah there's lots of opportunities out there Um, geez that time has flown I think um, I think we might just uh, finish on that point. But, yeah, it's been great having you here, Marvin. We didn't actually get to drink our coffee. I was trying to reach out and grab it, but um, we, <laughs> the virtual <laughs> coffee was was quite good. Um, right. But, yeah, like uh, anything you want to finish on? Yeah, um, yeah before we, we sign off. Yeah, I mean, for our listeners, especially in the Philippines and uh, well, e- even our partners, clients offshore, we have a, you know, I'd like, I just want to invite everyone if you get, if you have time on October 21 to 23, uh, we have a technology fair. Well, I'm also calling on our technology partners to support that activity. Zero mm-hmm. is going to be in there. Uh, uh, QuickBooks Online will be there. We've talked to some uh you know, analytics, reporting tools in Australia, New Zealand. Hopefully, they they'd come and support. SAP will be there, but um, yeah, first technology fair that's happening. Uh, all our speakers will be coming from our technology partners just to provide that insight and what's latest. 
and how they can help our practices and even our enterprises oh. you know, in the Philippines. So uh, please, uh, if you have time, uh, join that. Uh, also, you know, for the entire year, all the way to May, you know, the association will be conducting an, uh, at least 20 webinar series, primarily, again, focused on technology. So this will be given by our tech partners, uh, you know, software companies, uh, again, to promote adoption of, the, of these solutions. And hopefully that, uh, that program will continue even after the current administration of the association. So, um, yeah. yeah we wanna, we, we, when we send out this podcast, we might send some more information about the tech fair and what's coming up in those webinars. I'll get um, Erica to include that. And um, I know that there will be some credits roll through. I'm, I'm not sure how Erica's going to do it, but if people want to get a hold of you, you're on LinkedIn, Twitter, email. So you even got a phone, I understand. So we'll put those contact details up for you so people can get a hold of Marvin and either myself. And... Uh, yeah, so let's finish at this point and, and thank you for attending. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, thanks for having me, Wayne. Good to, as always, good chatting. A good virtual <laughs> chat. We need to do a proper yeah. one shortly. All right. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you so much for tuning in and I hope you liked our episode for today. One key takeaway I might want to highlight from hearing Marvin's story is that it pays to be a visionary. Always think long-term. All it took was one leap of faith and his dream benefited so many Filipinos and his name made a mark on a global accounting scale. And I love that he did not hesitate to tap into the Philippines, uh, Philippines accounting resource above every other countries in the world. I love that he believed in our people as much as his staff believes in him. So props to you, Sir Marvin. You are a truly Filipino pride. If you think it's something worth sharing and if you're into this kind of contents, please do not forget to like and subscribe to our channel, The Backroom Podcast. And once again, it's me, your guy, Ed, and this is The Backroom, connecting efficiencies through global talent. Catch you again soon. Bye.